just in there doing the thing. So we're looking in the window of the flow hive this morning and what we can see is hungry bees. And you can tell that because of the way they've eaten out some of the honey. On the right there you can see capped honey and on the left you can see open honey and if you look down the cells really closely you can see there's not even any nectar down the cells. So that's bees that aren't finding many flowers and they're getting a bit hungry. It's winter time here where we are and we often do get good flowers in winter but not at the moment. This morning's our beginner beekeeping Q&A so sometimes what can happen with beekeeping is there's a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge which is fantastic but people beginning feel a bit scared to ask those questions that might seem a bit silly so we dedicate this live stream to answering those questions that that might be a bit silly or you're a bit scared to ask or just any general beginner questions so don't be afraid put them in the comments below we'll get to answering those and uh, also let us know whereabouts in the world you are tuning in from. It's really interesting to us. We've got flow hives in 130 different countries and it's really good to know where the audience is so that we know uh, a bit about what the climate is like there where you are. So ask away. Okay. If I have a look in the other window, just while you're thinking of some questions, you can see there's no honey at all in this one. And not even that many bees because bees really throttle themselves to the conditions. And they, they don't really uh, start laying so many eggs, the queen doesn't lay so many eggs if there's not much nectar around, which is an important thing that they need to do because if you have a full hive of bees and, they, and lots more baby mouths to feed, etc., then and you might not have enough stores in the hive to do that. So you can see here, this, they've eaten out all of the honey in this frame. Okay, we've got a question coming in. Woods Friendly Garden is asking, how often should you inspect your hive when using a package? Okay, the answer is it depends like most things in beekeeping. So installing a package, for those that don't know, is basically getting in your bee suit. You're starting with the bottom box, little handy tip here. You can use this area here as a lift point. So that's a nice lift point there when you're lifting a box off the top. So installing a package is basically an artificial swarm. It's a bunch of bees that have been shaken into a box and usually comes with a little mated queen in a cage and some syrup to feed it while it's in the post. In the post, I know it's uh, amazing that you're allowed to send bees in the post but there you go. They rock up and you've got thousands of bees in a box and that's a case of putting them into your flow hive. Now, how often should you inspect when installing a pa package is the question. And the reason why it depends is it depends on what type of brood frames you are using. So we supply frames like this and a little strip to go in the top, which is for natural comb. The bees just hang here. It's called foundationless frames or naturally drawn comb. Now, if you're deciding to go with that approach, which is my favorite approach, then you'd be shaking your bees in here, putting the frames in and squeezing them all together. Now what you're hoping is going to happen is the bees will draw nice comb from this comb guide like this, hanging down, eventually start to connect it to the sides and continue out this way and fill up all the frames. Now, if you're going this route with naturally drawn combs, you'll want to inspect frequently in the beginning and you need to gauge sort of how fast your bees are actually building to know how often to inspect but basically you'll be uh, inspecting it at, at least um, every week for, for a little bit as they progress and once they get nice and straight on the comb then you can let them be for a while as they keep uh, progressing. The reason why you need to inspect um, 
uh, quite frequently in the beginning is you want to make sure they are going straight. If they start building totally crossways, you want to catch that early, turn that comb around, get it onto these guides and get them building straight. If you're using foundation, either plastic foundation sheets or wax foundation sheets with wire to reinforce it, which go through these holes in the sides, then they will be, uh, they'll be limited to how wonky they can go and they'll be uh, quite straight when they build so you won't need to inspect so often unless you've got some other issues going on like um, mites and things that we don't have in this country. Great question. Tonya Bond has a question. She says, I have a question about the white tray in the bottom of my new Flow Hive 2. I live in South Mississippi, USA, and I have a new five frame nuke full of Italian bees in the brood box. It's 90 degrees and human here. My hive is under an oak tree facing east southeast with filtered sunlight. I'm wondering if I should take my tray out for more ventilation. Okay, can someone throw the 90 degrees Fahrenheit um, to Celsius conversion for me? And stick it in the comments. Um, basically, this tray is um, designed in such a way that you can control the ventilation with this cover. So the question is about heat in the hive and humidity and ventilation. And the way we've designed it is if these vents are on top, then airflow can go through up above the handle here and up under the screen. So that will increase ventilation a lot, just turning that around so the vents are on top. If you want to decrease ventilation in the colder times, you can turn it around so the vents are at the bottom, the handle contacts here, and there's no vents that are allowing easy access up there. So that's the first thing you can do. Generally bees are pretty great at throttling themselves to, to the conditions. And even in extreme Australian heat and humidity, you, you don't actually need to have a screen bottom board. They'll still manage to cool their hive. So your bees will be fine. If you want to aid them, you could indeed pull the tray out altogether, allowing a lot of ventilation but I'd only really do that in those really hot times when the bees are so hot, they're, they're uh, all escaping the hive to allow more room for ventilation inside. And they're really like bearding and, and uh, all out the front here, clinging to the front of the hive. Then you might decide to pull the tray out. Otherwise, if you're just starting a colony and you're in an area with hive beetles, then I think be a good idea to put this tray in, put some oil in it and catch those beetles in there. Question? Cedar Google is saying it's 32.2 degrees Celsius. Okay, 32.2. So that's not that hot by Australian conditions, but it is getting warm and humid. Uh, so um, you could certainly just leave that tray in with the vents at the top and you, you've got enough ventilation as your hive starts. Probably wouldn't give them an extreme amount of air by pulling the tray all the way out until they've filled up their brood box. You don't want them to get a bit cool overnight. Having said that, bees are quite resourceful. My grandfather had a hive just hanging on a tree branch outside his house and it stayed there for years and years in, in Canberra, which gets very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter. They didn't even have a box around them at all. So bees are amazing at air conditioning and keeping their, their brood warm and cool. It's um, quite amazing. Another question. Hey, Rich is asking, what time of year should you, in, should you introduce your colony to flow and is it ever too late? Okay. The answer is, um, just going back to the question, what time of year should you put the super on? The super is the honey collection box and in our case, being a flow hive, it's our flow frames. So it's asking what time of year and would it be too late to put the flow box on? 
The answer to that would be what you're looking for before you super a beehive is flowers that are, that are coming. So you're making a prediction based on what the bees are doing. You're seeing them build up, you're seeing the numbers build up and you're taking a guess that the season is going to have a lot of nectar in flowers for your bees to use as a resource to keep building and storing honey. So if you think that there is flowers ahead, go for it and put the super on. If you think that there's uh, just, a, just about to be a long cold winter ahead, then you probably wouldn't put the super on because you want to limit the amount of space the bees have to look after, making it a bit easier for them to survive that long cold winter. So there's the, the kind of um, things you're thinking about to make that decision. Generally, people will put supers on in the, in the springtime as the bees build up. And the time to put it on is when this box is full with bees and all the frames are, are already drawn. By drawn, I mean the bees have built their honeycomb in each frame. So when there's a lot of bees, when you open the lid, and all the frames are drawn, put your super on. And the only reason why you wouldn't is if it's just about to be a really long time without flowers in, in the, uh, in, uh, with a winter coming. But in the, uh, in the autumn, some places have a good autumn flow and it still could be worth putting your box on if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, we're in our winter here, so I would probably wait till we get closer to spring before putting the box on. In our area, we do get good flowers in the winter, so we just leave the supers on all year round. Honey super is the top box with the flow frames in it. We just leave them on all year round, and um, that makes it a bit easier. In colder places, beekeepers tend to shrink their hive down a bit smaller for winter, making it a bit easier for the colonies to manage themselves and keep warm and survive through those cold months. Great questions, keep them coming. Naomi's asking, what skills are needed to assemble a flow hive? So Built this- in New South Wales. So we have about half of our beekeepers are brand new to, to beekeeping and mostly new to assembling a hive. So if you're having a bit of trouble with it, get a little bit of help, but generally, We've got good videos showing you just how to do it and we've tried to make it easy by um, including even the tool with these cedar hives. It's a nice soft wood and you can actually do it by hand without a drill. Although you probably want to do it in multiple sittings because your hand might get a bit sore screwing in all of these screws. But if you take it bit by bit, you can certainly assemble a hive by hand with the tool we give you. If, you're, um, if you want to speed things up, then use a drill and put the bit we give you in the end of the drill and that'll really speed up the time of putting these screws in. So it's a fun little project. If you get stuck, um, get some help by somebody who's handy. Otherwise, um, let us know how you go. It's quite interesting to us to, to, to find out about the experience of what, what it's like putting together a flow hive when um, it's something that you've never done before. Malcolm Anderson is saying hi from Botanic Ridge, Melbourne, Victoria. Hey Uncle Mac, it's good to, good to hear from you and I'm um, nice to see your picture of your hives a couple of days ago. I hope that they, um, they go well through the winter and you get some really nice, nice days and um, with, any, with any luck I'll be able to get down to Melbourne and see you soon. Peter, we've got some people asking about uh, hives freezing up in colder parts of Australia and what you can do to prevent this. Hives freezing up. Um, I'll need some uh, more elaboration on, on what that means. If, if the person asking the question could, um, could elaborate a bit more on it, that would be great. Um, because generally I'm not sure what freezing up would mean. Um, I assume it's to do with the harvesting of honey, but honey doesn't generally um, freeze. So, um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to know what particular issue you'd be having there. 
I think they were referring to whether or not you leave your super on over winter and how many brood boxes you should use. Uh, okay, so here we can leave the super on over winter. And if you're in a colder place, I mean, most bee books are written for extreme cold areas where there's snow and you're digging your hive out of the snow. In, in Australia, in our colder parts, you could go either way depending on how strong your colony is. Some people will be leaving um, a, their flow super on over winter and some won't. A little tip there, if you're leaving your flow super on, then you want to get in there prior to the winter and take out your excluder. Reason being, if the bees are moving up as a ball, staying warm, eating the honey as they go, you don't want to leave the queen behind under the excluder or she could perish from cold. So generally beekeepers will take out the excluder for when they're overwintering. Um, if you've got multiple boxes, the colony will shrink as the nectar flow dies at the end of the season. So to right size your hive for the size of your colony, it's not a bad idea to take some of the supers off and bring it down to, to um, perhaps just a couple of boxes. So you might have, depending on your setup, you might have decided to put a second brood box so you could take the supers off and just run two brood boxes or you might have had multiple supers, you might take some of the supers off and just pack it down to a brood box and one super for that cold time. Keep the questions coming in. Raylene Barnes Matlock is asking would the bees notice when a super is removed in preparation for winter? So the bees will certainly notice whenever you do um, things of pulling apart the hive and if they're, if they're um, a colony that has uh, aggressive traits, they'll certainly let you know. Sometimes you've got a really, a really placid colony and you can pull boxes off and things without even a bee suit on at all. But only do that once you're experienced with beekeeping very comfortable. The, um, so I would certainly say the bees will notice and it's, uh, I guess, we're making decisions in the, in the best interest of the bees and what we try and do is give them a helping hand uh, so that they're, they're more likely to, to do well. But um, we don't always make the best decisions for them, but we try and we can only do that from the advice we get and the experience we, we have, but generally, it is a um, good idea if you live in a colder area to reduce the size of your hive to, to uh, two boxes or even sometimes one box so they can survive that winter time. Jordan Smith asks, does the super need to be fastened to the brood box or does it just sit there? Cheers. That's a great question and one that, that comes up with um, new beekeepers, particularly if they're handy and, and um, thinking about how things go together. And the answer is the bees glue the boxes together. It's um, surprising, but that's the way it works in beekeeping. You put your box on top, the bees get up there and connect their wax and propolis. Sometimes you get a little bit of drift and I'm just looking at this. It's probably moved slightly just from opening the hive the other day and putting it back not in the right spot. But generally there isn't any problem. At the most you get just like a little bit of drift as it, as it settles in and the bees glue it into position. If you do get a bit of um, movement like that and you want to put it back to, to being um, flush on the side, sometimes all you need to do is just apply a bit of pressure and I'll try that now here just by applying but they may have glued it up too much already. There we go, so just pushing it back into line and now, now it's in line here rather than being slightly out. So that's the most you need to do really. If it's really stuck and you don't want to pull the box off, you can actually uh, use one of those woodworking clamps, um, the kind of ones with the soft plastic ends that you have the squeeze grip on, and, and that can ha apply enough pressure to pull the boxes back into line without having to pull the hive apart. 
But it's amazing, even with 80 km an hour winds here, we ha actually haven't had the boxes separate and blow off because the bees, one that's quite heavy with honey often, but also the bees just stick the, the uh, hive parts together with their propolis. Okay, another pretty empty frame. There's not even any nectar glistening. The tuckaroos have just started flowering down here in the coastal region, hoping they'll be able to collect a little bit of nectar to give them a bit of a, a prop up during this hungry time. We had a lot of fires here in Australia in, in, during the summer and it really uh, did limit the amount of flowers. I guess the, um, the, the, the way the trees decide to flower is set up in advance, so a lot of species would have retracted in that really dry time and we're not seeing the usual flowers we get. But hopefully with the, the recent rains, then we're going to see a really nice spring to come. Colin Burton wants to know, how do you know you're buying calm bees rather than vicious stingy buggers? <laughs> Good question. Um, the, the way you get nice calm bees is buy bees from a bee breeder and ask for calm genetics. They'll know their bees. They're very experienced with, with bees and they'll be able to give you a nice calm colony. If you buy a nucleus, then you'll really know because they can, they can have a look at the hive, have a bit of a play with it and decide whether they're calm or not before they give it to you. If you're buying a a, um, a package of bees then you're hoping that the mated queen they give you has calm genetics and it's most likely that it does for natural mating so the uh, the queen when it's a virgin is taking off for mating with drones from around the area there's a chance you could get some aggressive traits in there as well so the best way to really know whether you've got a calm hive is to buy a nucleus which is basically four or five little frames in a small box and a going beehive and when you transfer them into your box and look after them they'll grow from there. You can also replace a queen in an aggressive hive and um, that will change the genetics a, a month later you'll have a whole different uh, temperament in your hive which is an amazing thing. Tanya Lee wants to know Flow Hive 2 versus Flow Hive Hybrid for brand new beekeeper in Melbourne. Okay, so the hybrid, it's interesting. We thought the hybrid would be exceedingly popular, but generally the Flow Hive 2 with the, with the full rack of frames here, either six or seven, is, is the most popular. So what the hybrid is, is a box that has, has flow frames in the middle and conventional honey frames either side. I don't have an example set up right here in front of me but what that allows you to do is collect honeycomb on the edges and honey on tap in the center of your hive. Works quite nicely to collect your honeycomb you do need to take off the lid get in your get out your smoker and bee suit and sometimes depending on whether you're using foundation or not if you're not using foundation can get a little bit messy pulling out those frames on the edge because you've got to get in here and uh, if, if the bees uh, have gone a little bit wonky and connected it to the walls, etc., you'll have to excavate that comb, pull it out, and then you've got this beautiful honeycomb for the table. You can also collect honeycomb under the lid of a flow hive. So that's another strategy. You can get, you can take out the plug in the top here, and I'll show you that now. And when your colony really expands, and only once there's a lot of bees and they've filled up the box, they will then start filling this roof cavity. So some people like to leave that plug out. Our classics didn't have the plug and they'll fill this whole area with comb under the roof. If you want to contain them a little more, you can get perhaps a, um, a, a Pyrex uh, dish, um, one of those nice glass dishes so you can enjoy watching it happen. Put it over here and it'll contain them to a smaller area of honeycomb. Rachel Falcon says, I see my flow tray has different sh color shades of wax. 
Does this mean my honey will be the color of these shavings? That's a great question. So in the bottom here, sometimes you get, get various different colors. Perhaps I can find an example. Um, and the reason why you get different colors is sometimes the bees are recycling wax and sometimes they're creating new wax. So you can see it right here. So there's these little shavings of wax that are falling through. It's a good idea to clean it out every now and then because if you leave it build up too much, wax moths and things will start living in that area. But here you can see this yellow wax in lines that basically represent each frame. That's because the bees are getting in there, they're chewing away the frame, there's little bits of wax dropping down to the bottom. Now sometimes you'll see it's brown and sometimes you'll see it's white and sometimes yellow and everything in between. The brown dark wax is from older frames that have been used a lot more and the, the bee footprints have built up and also when the bees go through their larvae stage there's a silk cocoon which, uh, which darkens the wax as well. So when they're chewing those frames away you'll notice that the, there'll be darker lines of wax. And then when you get into typically the springtime where there's a whole lot of baby bees emerging they'll all be testing out their wax glands for the first time and that brand new wax is quite white and you'll see these flakes of white uh, wax falling down to the bottom. So it's, it's quite interesting to look in here and learn about what's going on in your hive. So I'm not seeing any white wax here, which means there's not any baby bees testing out their wax glands, which means that the bees um, aren't building up right now, which rings true with the season and what we're seeing in the side windows as well. Keep the questions coming in. Dave Horn says, I have flow frames which are leaking into the flow compartment. How can I stop this from happening? Okay. The, um, I'll show you that right now, back on this hive over here. So, if you have a look at the rear of this hive here, you can see there's a trough area and a, a honey collection tube plugs into this point here. And these caps come out just by pulling them out like this. And what happens when you harvest a frame is the remaining honey might keep dripping into the, into the trough for a little while. And also depending on how well the, the bees seal all the parts together, you might even get some drips of honey coming into that trough area while the bees are producing honey. So what happens is it can build up, but when we were inventing the flow hive, we, we um, thought about a solution for this. And what we've done is made a little gap down here so underneath the, the yellow part to the clear part. And what that allows is when you put this cap back in, there's these little ridges and the remaining honey will drip back into the hive for the bees to reuse. So that allows you to, to not have to wait for hours for the very last dribbles of honey. You can just do your harvest and when that stream has slowed down, put the cap back in and walk away. And you'll actually see the bees' tongues licking up into this area. And, and recycling that last bit of honey. So to answer your question, how do you stop it? Bees will be bees and they'll block that leak back point is what we call it. And what you'll need to do is just unblock it. So each time you poke the tube in, there's a little tongue that pokes into that area. So we tried to design it so you didn't have to think about it. You harvest it, unblocks it for you. You don't have to think about it, but Bees will be bees and they'll block it up. In the meantime, it's a good idea to clear it by, by just inserting a little stick or inserting the tube in there or even the end of the metal flow little gap. Then you can put your cap back in and the remaining honey will drip into the hive. Caveat on that, 
if the honey's been in there a long time, then if you're in a humid area, fermentation could occur and have a taste of it. If it tastes fermented, just put a tube in and drain it away rather than letting it go back into the hive. If, if, um, cause, uh, fermented honey can give the bees dysentery. If the, the, it's gone candied because you're in a drier climate and the honey's been sitting in there, then you could clean that out if you want to by getting the flow key, wrapping uh, cloths around it and poking it in this area. Or in an extreme situation, you can put the tube in and actually fill the trough area with a hose. Don't seal it because you don't want to flood water into the hive, but you can wash some water into that area, then out again, and that would also clean that trough area. Generally, you don't have to do anything. You can, um, you can just go and harvest. But uh, if it does get a bit, bit manky in there, then you can clean it out like that. Another little trick is sometimes just turning this cap around can, can break that little bit of wax or propolis they've put at the leak back point. So you give it a bit of a spin, have a little look and see if the bee's tongues are starting to come up into that trough area and that will also clear it. Andrew Bruce wants to know how far from a water source does your hive need to be? You don't actually need a water source right by your hives. In fact, sometimes the bees prefer to fly a little way to get their water. So uh, they'll, they'll even fly kilometers to get water to a dam or whatnot. But bees like minerals, so you'll actually find they'll go for a salty swimming pool before they'll go for fresh water, or they'll go for muddy water before they'll go for fresh water. So if you do want to feed your bees, then if you've got a, 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 a bottle of water this size or so, put a teaspoon of salt in that water, the bees will prefer that over the fresh water because like us, bees need minerals as well. It doesn't really matter if it's Himalayan rock salt or sea salt, the bees will like those, prefer that water. Ronald is saying, hi, I'm from New Mexico and the heat is reaching triple digits. Is there anything I can do to help the bees stay cool? I already pulled the tray out to allow more airflow. Okay, triple digits, that is getting hot. So, so um, pulling the tray out to, to give more airflow, great, you've already done that. The next thing is shade. If you can give them shade, particularly in those hot afternoons, then that will really help your hive. So you might decide you want to move your hive and there's different ways you can move your hive or you might like to um, actually erect a bit of a shade so in the afternoon your hive doesn't get that beating sun and that will help your bees immensely. The, uh, some people keeping bees on rooftops in extreme heat like that can run into a situation where the bees melt down because you've got the heat of the roof and really hot days and I've actually got some friends who had a couple of hives on the roof, they were conventional hives, they didn't have the screen bottom board for extra ventilation. And they actually had honey dripping down the light fitting and onto the kitchen table here in Melbourne, Australia. And they were like, hang on, something's wrong. Went up on the roof, scorching hot day, and the temperature inside the hive had exceeded the, the wax melt temperature a lot had melted down, flowed down the roof and somehow found its way down the light fitting. So a bit of a sad story for those bees. If you're in extreme heat, especially if your hives are on the roof, make sure you get your hives some shade. Putter32 says, Hi, I have a flow hive too and I live in Victoria and my plastic bottom tray has been full of water. Is there a reason for this and how do I stop it? Okay, if you get um, a lot of rain, uh, sometimes, especially if the wind's blowing it into the entrance, even though we've put a, a landing board here that has a downway slope and a piece of metal here that has a downway slope, you can get uh, rain filling up your tray. It's a case of just emptying it out and, um, 
and that's all you need to do. However, if that gets annoying, you could run your tray upside down and you'll get let, and then you won't have to do that step. So if you get this tray here and turn it up the other way, then rain can't pull in it and you can still use it as a ventilation blocker. Okay, we've got time for a couple more questions. We're getting thin here. It's um, fantastic. Thank you for asking all the questions. We try to be here every week to, to answer questions and make sure that um, you're getting the best start you can. In the end, if we can look after our bees, then we get the beautiful reward of honey and the satisfaction of providing pollination as well. So um, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing, beekeeping, and uh, certainly um, it's fantastic to be having so many beekeepers in the world starting out and learning and asking those questions, because in the end we need to, to uh, pass on the knowledge from more experienced beekeepers to the new beekeepers in order to increase the number of beekeepers in the world. In uh, the USA, 40 years ago, we had 200,000 beekeepers and then that number fell to 100,000 beekeepers. So there was a real downward trend and it's great to be reversing that and seeing a upward climb and the popularity of beekeeping really increasing and city beekeeping, urban beekeeping, backyard beekeeping, uh, boutique uh, honey production is, is fantastic. We get a, a widespread of gene pools and we're really getting that uh, knowledge and continuing to pass it on. All right, our final question for the morning is from Ben Pearson and he says, we have bees in a hollow tree that has fallen down near our house. How can we get them in a flow hive or what do you suggest? Okay, bees in a fallen tree. So this is a bit advanced, so you'd be the adventurous type if you want to start from doing what's called a cutout. Um, there's various different ways to get bees out of a cavity. Sometimes they're in a wall, sometimes they're in a tree. And I would first try non-destructive methods, but it's a bit long-winded. But if you have a win, it saves you cutting apart the hive, etc. So getting bees out of a cavity can be quite difficult, but the way I have had success, and this was a little tip from my brother who's an arborist, and sometimes he needs to get bees out of a, a cavity before working on that tree, and you can get a cat and dog flea collar and, and insert that into the cavity. Now, sometimes just it doesn't kill the bees, but it's irritating and the bees perhaps uh, four or six weeks later might leave that home to create a new one. So it's an opportune moment to, to um, get them moving into a box that you've placed right outside the, uh, the cavity where they're leaving and you could even rig up a, a pipe from their entrance into your hive so the bees can simply move from the cavity into the hive. Now one, one um, tip to, to go even further is you can create a one-way bee valve by getting a piece of pipe and, and inside it you put a cone of fly mesh, the typical mesh you get on screen doors. You make a little cone like this and you can imagine the bees are passing through that cone and it's easy to go one way and hard to go back the other way. So that will get a lot of the bees out of the cavity and into your box. If you can add a frame of brood from another hive, that will really help and the bees will be staying in that outside box and starting to look after that brood. And eventually you end up with the numbers in the wall so low that you might even find the queen or wander out and join the colony outside. So while I've had success, I've also had fails with that method. A surefire way is actually to cut apart the cavity and that involves um, being very disruptive, getting out your power tools, chainsaws, etc., and cutting it apart, getting the, the sections of brood and uh, rubber banding them into frames like this. So if you can imagine getting a section of brood, cutting it out of the wall or tree hollow, 
and using rubber bands around this way to, to hold it in there while the bees attach it to the frame. Now, this is all quite advanced. I uh, wouldn't suggest doing that, that as your introduction to beekeeping unless you're that type of person who really wants to jump right in there and have a go. Um, but once you've got the brood in there and you've cut the hive apart, all the bees will then go to the new hive. A little tip, don't put any honey in the box if you're in an area with hive beetles. Reason being is if you've got a big mess for the bees to clean up and the bees are quite disrupted, those hive beetles might take the opportunity to lay eggs throughout your hive and it could turn into a hive beetle maggot nest instead of a beehive, which isn't much fun to clean up. Now, um, so just use the brood sections and rubber band them into the frames and the bees will then move to your box. So there's lots of videos. Hilary Kearney does lots of cutouts. She's got some great examples and tips as well. That could be a good place to go to find out information if you want to go down that route. Um, we've, we've got a video we're making, but we haven't put it out yet, of a, of a cutout in a wall cavity down the road from here. So that would have some, some great information in it too when we get to releasing that video. Thank you for asking all of the questions. We'll try to be here to answer all your questions every week and uh, hopefully that'll help you get started in this amazing pursuit of beekeeping. If we look after the bees, it's only then that we get rewarded with the amazing honey that we can fill our jars and bring